Hi everyone and welcome to the first edition of the Sunday Sessions, a monthly podcast where we interview people from across the diocese of in, uh, inspiring stories of faith and hopefully interesting conversations that will help you deepen your faith further. For our first edition, we have two very special guests. Well, one and then one other, but don't worry about that. Our first <laughs> special guest is um, Bishop June. So the Bishop of uh, the Bishop of Flandaf has joined us today. Bishop, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Matt. It's good to be with you. Good, good. All the way from Sleeseskob. Absolutely, in sunny Flandaf. In <laughs> sunny Flandaf, fantastic. And our second special guest is Father David Morris, who's the Diocesan Director of Ordinance. David, how are you today? Very well, thanks, Matt. Coping in lockdown. Coping in lockdown, I see. Yeah, how, what have you been up to this week? The garden, mainly, uh, as well as other things. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Okay, the first session um, we're, we're doing is uh, because it's Vocation Sunday. So this goes out on Sunday and it's Vocation Sunday. And for those of you who are following us on social media, you will have seen a lot of videos and a lot of blogs of people from across the diocese talking about how they've responded to God's call. And all that is part of our lead up to Vocation Sunday. And the work has been led by David Morris. And so for this session, David and the Bishop are having a conversation about faith and about journeys of faith and um, in vocations to help you think about your vocation, but also to understand um, how do people respond to God's call and how do you know that God is calling you? So David, I'm going to hand over to you and thank you very much both for joining us on the first Sunday sessions. Thank you, Matt. Um, Bishop June, it's uh, fantastic that we can still have this conversation because, of course, uh, we had planned at the beginning of March to do this in person before uh, the world went a bit crazy. Um, I think the first question that um, I'd like to ask you really is about um, where your journey of faith started. Where did it all begin? Um, well, um, the more I think about it, David, the more I realize that uh, it started before I was born. You know, that's what Psalm 139 says, isn't it? That uh, whilst I was still in my mother's womb, uh, that you created me. And that's particularly significant for me because I was born out of wedlock. Um, my mother got thrown out of her home. Uh, her father wouldn't tolerate the fact that she'd got pregnant without being married. And so I wasn't uh, exactly a welcome birth. And so the idea that God was there uh, when I was conceived uh, is very special in some ways. My baptism, uh, my, my family weren't churchgoers, um, but uh, my baptism followed. They dutifully took me to church. I think it was the last time they, they ever took me to church when I was about six weeks old. In an inner city area in Manchester, uh, where the church didn't feel as if it had much relevance to their daily life, but I was baptised and I've always treasured the fact that uh, I, um, I stand in that baptism. Uh, that was the moment uh, when I became a Christian and uh, when I, first of all, had the promise of God's grace. Um, and um, after that, um, I suppose the next stage was when I was about eight or nine years old. Um, as I say, I'd, I'd never been taken to church. I didn't know anything about uh, the church life, the community of faith or worship. Uh, but I had a profound sense, as children often do at that age, I believe, a profound sense of the divine in my life, of the, the magnificence, of the awesome nature of the universe. Um, and so... Um, uh, I reached out to God uh, with a sense of uh, how do I how do I connect with you, God? And the answer seemed to me to be pretty straightforward. I think I'd had I think I'd had uh, a Christian teacher, uh, and uh, knowing Jesus and finding the community of faith seemed to me to be the logical next steps. But um, if I carry on, I'll tell you my whole life history. And so let me just say that it's what, it's what really informs my passion 
for reaching out to younger people, um, school age children particularly, because uh, I'm absolutely convinced that many of those of us who would talk about a faith journey know that it started when actually we were very young. Absolutely. Which is an interesting point actually, just coming in there um, about our Young Faith Matters project. Uh, yeah. which is really interesting to hear you say that because I didn't realize that was such a drive in your life um, so it's, it's it kind of makes some connections about um, our commitment and our vision to uh, reach out to young people across the diocese. Well we kind of wait until children and young people are old enough to uh, rationalize, to participate to to do all the things that kind of uh, middle-aged people think you have to wait until you've grown up before you you kind of get given a voice and of course that's absolutely not true very often and Jesus said this to us didn't he very often it's young children who give us insights into wisdom and who have a spiritual depth and our job as uh, as the church is to make sure that we not just honor that but actually we ask those children uh, what God might have in store for them and what the purposes uh, of their life are. I have the great privilege of confirming uh, people and very often I'm confirming children between the ages of about 11 and 15 and uh, I, I try very hard to engage them in a conversation at that age about uh, where are God's purposes for your life? What, what are the exciting things that he might have in store for you? And, you know, they never disappoint me. They never say, oh, Bishop, wait until I've grown up. They <laughs> say, do you know, Bishop, it's funny you should ask me that, but I really think, and dot, 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 you know, they have a sense of where God is nudging them, e even as a young teenager. And it was because of uh, my incumbent asking me the question as a teenager, you know, is God calling you to be a priest? That I ended up exploring that um, uh, during university and, and then um, initially after university and went to college at such a young age. Um, so, I, you know, my, my own story sort of resonates with what you're saying, really. Um, and sometimes yeah. it's not just about saying to young people, have you thought about this? It's also about redirecting their expectations, you know, raising their expectations. I get the privilege because I'm a bishop. Sometimes people listen to what I have to say. And sometimes I say to them, uh, what are your dreams? Are you, are you thinking of something big enough? Um, because quite a lot of young people think that God might be asking something, but say, no, it couldn't possibly be me. I, I'm, I don't have the confidence or I don't have the skills. And um, so sometimes actually the role we can play is to, to raise people's expectations. Uh, there's a very funny part of my life really, which was that when I left university, I was heading towards training to be a solicitor. And I have a friend who had the courage to say to me, as I was in my last year at university, you will make a terrible solicitor. And uh, uh, this is what you ought to do instead, he said. And he, and he encouraged me uh, to, to study some theology and to go and work for the church for a while. And I thought to myself, okay, all right, I'll just put off the, uh, the, the training to be a solicitor. I'll go and do some church stuff for a while. And I never looked back. And he was absolutely right. I would have been a disastrous solicitor. <laughs> Well, we are glad that you didn't become a solicitor and um, that you went on to explore a call to ministry. Um, how, how did you know that God was calling you? How would you sort of articulate that sense of vocation? Um, when did you first experience it? Um, the, image, the image I often uh, use, David, for myself is that it was like a developing photograph. I know it's a very old fashioned image now that uh, digital cameras are everything, <laughs> but um, if you go back to how photographs used to happen, where the image on the photograph came slowly to be clearer. Of course, I didn't know at 21 
that uh, I was going to be uh, a priest and a bishop. I, uh, I wasn't even sure that uh, I was fit for working in church ministry at all. Um, but it was actually making the step into trying things out and to respond, I have to say, to people who encouraged me. Uh, you know, fantastic gift if we can encourage other people to think of what they could become. And gradually over the years, uh, that image became stronger and stronger of what I would look like as a priest or what a priest would look like if it were me. Of course, it, it was complicated uh, for me because um, you couldn't be uh, a deacon or a priest when I first offered myself for the church's ministry. Um, you could be a deaconess, uh, which was a lay ministry. Uh, so I started as a parish worker, which was just kind of a, a lay assistant in parish life. And then I uh, um, did some training and became a deaconess. So I was a deaconess for seven years when the church at that stage was pretty neurotic about gender and sexuality and uh, was it going to let women into the threefold order of ministry of deacon, priest and bishop. And, you know, we're, we've, we're celebrating this year the centenary of the church in Wales and it's a bit shameful to think that actually uh, all through that hundred years the Anglican church in this country, both in Wales and in other parts of the UK, have been debating whether it was possible to let somebody like me uh, into that ministry. But that uh, is something that, of course, our, um, our women don't have to encounter these days because we are uh, absolutely fantastically encouraged by people of, of all uh, senses of identity uh, in the ministry. In fact, it enriches our life. The more diverse the identities we bring uh, to the same ministry, and I, I learned over those years um, both to be very loyal to the church that would not ordain me. Uh, I adore the Anglican Church, uh, but to also to be able to kind of lean in and say to the church, if you weren't prepared to test my call, you shouldn't have baptised me. That's a really interesting point. Do you, do you look back and think you can't believe how far things have moved on or do you think it hasn't moved on far enough? Uh, I'm, I have a real contradiction about mm. this because um, it would be unrealistic of me not to be um, ashamed of how slow the church was uh, to welcome women into ministry. Um, I, and I was affected by it. You know, it was, it was almost 20 years of church ministry before I was allowed to test my call to being a priest, to a, a, a be, a being a priest. Um, and... Uh, and yet, all the time, all through those years and still, I have this fantastic sense of privilege that, um, first of all, somebody from my background, uh, somebody from a poor urban uh, area uh, could, without all the uh, sophistication and the cultivation of having been brought up in the church, could end up where I am. But also historically, uh, how inspiring it is to live in this generation. You know, some of the, the women who I look back on, uh, people like Elizabeth Wordsworth, who went on to open a couple of Oxford colleges for women so they could gain education in the 19th century. People like Florence Nightingale, who almost certainly had a call uh, to priesthood that was thwarted by the church. Um, I don't, I don't look at those and, and snarl about uh, the church's inadequacy. I look back and think, thank you, God, that in this day, uh, actually, uh, the call of all people is now possible. 
and I rejoice in it. And we have fantastic women vicars in the Diocese of Llandaff. We have very brilliant male vicars as well. But I want to make the point that now the conversation is not around who do we exclude, but how do we test the call of, of people? Um, and God's call is so rich and deep and on so many different levels that I find that utterly inspiring. That's fantastic. And um, it is great that we've got such diversity uh, within ministry. Um, it's also interesting that um, obviously at one time you faced the prospect of not being uh, admitted to the diaconate, the priesthood and the episcopate. So you've traveled quite a, a remarkable journey in that respect, but you've also been called to Wales, um, a province um, that was uh, not on your radar, I suppose, uh, largely throughout your ministry. Um, and um, so how has it been uh, for you to not only become a bishop, but also to become a bishop in Wales? Well, it was on my radar. Wales was on my radar. I'm not sure about the church in Wales and ministry right. here. Yeah. But was on my radar because my husband is very Welsh and was born he uh, was born only about a couple of miles from where we now live and uh, you'd need to meet my uh, family of in-laws to really know how Welsh uh, they they are and and indeed our daughter played uh, lacrosse for Wales at one stage uh, so you can see that the family loyalties, uh, I could have predicted in some ways uh, <laughs> that Wales would, would call me. Um, do you know one of the things about um, ministry is that you can never predict where God is going to call you. Uh, and uh, when we offer ourselves to the ministry of the church, we do so on this understanding that if the church needs us to be deployed in a, a different place, we go there. And we not only go, but we really plant our feet down in the soil of somewhere that might be quite alien. Just think about the different places I've, I've worked. Um, uh, inner city Birmingham. I, I was chaplain of Birmingham Children's Hospital and worked at the city centre church of St. Martin's. Um, I worked in the East End of London, which was incredibly multi-faith. I then went to rural Wiltshire. Um, and so actually stepping into Wales, and uh, I must admit, uh, I absolutely love this diocese. I love it in its diversity and its richness and its, oh, it's just terrific at all sorts of levels. So I count it to have been a great privilege. but. Uh, I'd, I'd want you to see that the step from uh, Wiltshire into Wales wasn't so different from, uh, as a northerner, David, uh, going down to the south of England was a bigger uh, <laughs> cultural shock than it was to come to Wales where all Paul's family roots are. Mm. And I had, you know, we've been married for um 36 years and so i'd lived within that welsh blood for all of those years and um uh it's true to say isn't it um that um our life our lives are often um often have many dimensions to them um and uh uh that actually a person might have uh, several vocations on the go at one time um, so a person, for example, could be called to um, a, a particular profession, nursing uh, the police or, or, or those sorts of professions, um, but also um, to be a reader in the church, and then also uh, to be uh, a parent, and also to be a spouse. Mm. Um, you are um, a wife and also a mother uh, and a bishop. Um, how do your other vocations sort of impact on your ministry? Um, how, how do they relate and connect? It's such a good point to, uh, to, to stress that multi-layered approach. And if I can just uh, build on what you've said, um, our first vocation is to be a good human being. 
you know, uh, St. Irenaeus talked about uh, really a Christian being uh, a human person who was fully alive. And uh, so actually I would say to everybody, your first question is about, uh, um, uh, can, you, can you look at your life and think about it uh, as an abundant life? Because that's God's first calling to you. Live, choose life, live abundantly. And then, uh, of course, there, is, uh, there are choices about uh, where the commitments, the covenants you make within that life. Um, I've been very uh, fortunate to um, be married and to be a, a mother. Um, uh, I would say that actually the experience of being a mother has made me a, a, a better priest. Um, uh, uh, thinking about my frailties and and inadequacies in relation to ministry, because every minister of the church is a wounded healer, a, a, a person who brings a, a brokenness to the experience of the role. Um, and my children have done me huge favours. First of all, they never take me very seriously. Whatever I whatever I say. Although, you know, they're, they're, they're very loving and we're a very close family, I can just see written all over their face when I'm pontificating about something. Oh, yeah, mum. Oh, yeah. And so um, in all sorts of ways, um, uh, I am so deeply grateful uh, for uh, that family life. And I want it for other people. I want it. Uh, I want... I want intimate relationships for other people. And it's perhaps why I also want for those in ministry, I want them to feel that they can be good enough parents, good parents. But, you know, the principle of all our vocations is that God asks us to be good enough. He doesn't ask us to be perfect. The people who very often come unstuck in ministry are those who are trying to be perfect. So yeah, um, that's a very long way away from your point, David, but it's absolutely right that um, we live multi-layered lives. We live lives of different commitments, um, but undergirding it all, God's, God's fantastically deep love for us says, are you living life? Are you choosing life? Absolutely. Um, so, so true. Um, and there are many people who, um, who accompany us uh, along uh, our journeys. And uh, you mentioned how the children have sort of um, uh, had, a, had an impact on, on how you relate to others and, and on your ministry. Um, and you've also, men also mentioned other people who have been inspirations to you um, earlier on. Um, and I just wondered, um, of all of the people who um, have have been a part of your life or um, of whom you are aware, who's been the most sort of inspirational role model or perhaps even uh, sort of your most inspirational uh, spiritual guide, if you like? Well, I do, uh, as I said earlier, I do owe a very great debt to those who could imagine me in ministry and who, uh, uh, pushed me and encouraged me and so there's a whole trail of of um, friends and colleagues that I've worked with who I'm profoundly grateful to because whenever I was tempted to say oh I don't think I can do that they said of course you can of course you can do it um, and and they also uh were very important in providing me with um, a perspective and insights when I was finding the church difficult. Um, uh, the church is an institution and sometimes it lets us down and therefore the people who uh, have been really valuable to me are people who have also loved the church but been aware 
of its frailties. Um, in particular, I, like many uh, priests, would say that my training incumbent, that is the person who was responsible for supervising me in the first three years when I was in a accredited ministry, when I was a deaconess, uh, played a very particular role. I still have immense affection for his wisdom and patience and long suffering that he, in, in mentoring uh, me. And the other people who I owe a great debt to, uh, I've had a, a small number of, of really good spiritual directors, people who I've had to go to from time to time and let them see all the untidiness and the unresolvedness and, and, and encourage me to see myself as God sees me, not fretting with all the things that uh, I see in myself, but to see through God's lens at what's going on. And I suppose that they have been the people who have enabled me to see that you never know on any day when you get up and you try to do something for God, you never know where God's grace is going to manifest itself, where it's going to appear. That's one of the most extraordinary and interesting things about life, isn't it? There will always be grace every day. Bishop, can I just ask a quick question? Um, yeah. Just to say, do you see yourself as a role model with all that you've achieved, sitting now um, in Lise Escob as a bishop and all looking back on, on, on your ministry? Do you consider yourself as a role model to others? I really try not to. Matt. I, I really try not to see myself as a role model. And I don't know whether that's just because, uh, like all other um, uh, clergy, I just get on with the tasks that are given to me. You know, the pastoral care and the direction of of the church's life. I don't like to big up uh, what uh, my contribution might be. Um, but it is true that the other side of that is that um, I know that I know that there are a lot of uh, uh, ordained people, men and women, who I have um, mentored or promoted or uh, um, uh, sometimes taken their part and, uh, and, and who uh, I've, who wouldn't be doing what they're doing unless I had encouraged them. And that's the important bit because, you know, that's available to all of us. You don't have to be the first woman Bishop of Llandaff. You don't have to be holding any kind of authority uh, in order to encourage somebody on the next step of their journey. What brings you... I, I'm intrigued to know, what brings you the most joy um, in ministry? Um, never knowing what the day will bring. Um, uh, there, are, uh, there are some things that um, I've been part of in ministry, which I look back on and feel really good about. Um, uh, we were talking just the other day about a uh, uh, a young boy, a schoolboy, who was in one of my congregations in the East End of London. And um, I got him some work experience because uh, I asked a favour of somebody. And he, uh, and he just flew from that point on. He's been in the same firm now for 25 years and he's almost at the top of, of uh, his profession. So there are some things I look back on and think, yes. That was great to, to just make the connection. Um, but actually, um, the daily delight of ministry is that something new is going to be asked of you, something you didn't predict. Uh, and uh, at that point, everything you've done before, everything you've ever thought you'd achieved is going to be relevant because on this day, in this moment, you've got to get it right. You've got to speak of the love of God. You've got to um, 
you've got to see uh, God through the human things of the day. And that's what's so magical about being in this enterprise. If God calls you uh, uh, in any capacity, uh, as a Christian, uh, in church ministry, um, uh, do not doubt uh, that there will be a challenge ahead of you because uh, that's the excitement he promises. It's really great to see um, the pilgrim bear and the pilgrim candle uh, behind you. Um, and of course, we're still in the year of pilgrimage. Uh, I'm particularly hoping that one pilgrimage everybody will make is a sort of inner pilgrimage of discernment um, to work out what you know God is calling them to do. Um, what would you what would you say to someone who's toying with the idea of of exploring a call? You know, they're 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 not not hugely confident uh, enough to to just make that first step and just need a little word of encouragement. What how, how, what would you say to them? Well, I would have said, even before this crisis, I would have said, don't hang about. You know, get on with it. Uh, it might be that uh, the road isn't all straightforward and it might be that it deviates and, and it's not as you might predict, but get on with it. <laughs> uh, find out if you do have a calling from God in a particular direction in your life. But you know what this crisis has done is that um, we are going to be asking ourselves, aren't we, uh, what kind of people we want to be, what kind of society we want to be, and as a result, what kind of church do we want to be in the days ahead? Uh, the answers are no longer the ones we would have given six months ago, and they're not the the obvious uh pat answers that we might have come out with we are remaking life and so what better time at the moment to say what kind of person do i want to be what kind of response do i want to give to god and if there are new opportunities there'll be lots of people to help you work it out but the first thing you do have to do is to make the first step towards somebody like you give you a ring and say, I've no idea if there's anything in this, but can I talk about it? Don't hang about, get on with it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we're probably um, drawing uh, potentially the conversation uh, to a close, um, but um, I wanted to ask you, um, what does a bishop do to unwind? Uh, what do you do to sort of relax uh, when, after a busy day? Well, I wouldn't exactly say it's uh, relaxing, but I watch a lot of football and that's not on offer at the moment. But uh, you, um, some of you may know that I'm a lifelong uh, Manchester City supporter. And so I, uh, and I'm in a mixed marriage. So the rest of my family support Tottenham Hotspur. And I also am a member at Cardiff City. So all of that's been taken away. I do read a lot. Um, I'm, re I'm currently plowing my way through 800 pages of Hilary Mantel about uh, Thomas Cromwell's life. Uh, wonderful writing, uh, wonderful. But, um, uh, so I do read a lot. I love uh, Scandinavian noir films and, and books. Uh, um, so if there isn't, if there's one that I haven't watched or I haven't read, please uh, encourage me by, by letting me have it. Um, uh, so, and I, um, I like spending time with my family. Um, my children uh, um, are in their um, young adult life. Uh, their lives are rich and full and I'm lucky enough uh, that they quite often want to do things with me. And so, um, no, I think that um, to going back to what I was saying about uh, being a fulfilled human being, that actually really, really good ministry of the church means that you have to keep a life that is, is broad and beyond uh, just what the duties uh, are. So, um, I never, I never have a shortage of things uh, that 
I enjoy inventing um, when, um, when time allows, David. And good friends. That's the, other, <laughs> that's the other thing I would say. What yeah. a gift from God good friends are. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Matt, for hosting this conversation. Ah, you're very welcome. But I'm not going to let you go just yet, David, because it's Vocation Sunday. So if anyone has listened to this conversation and is feeling inspired, is looking to make, to make the next steps and is thinking, why hang around? They're going to listen to the bishop and think, oh, let's not hang around. Let's, let's answer this call. What should they do? What should they do next, David? Absolutely. There's several things um, someone can do. Um, to, to, to take the first step. And um, that can be to have initial conversations with um, your parish priest or even um, fellow parishioners. And, um, and also um, there are a number of members of the vocations team who um, would be happy to have conversations with um, people exploring a call. And our details can be found on the website and uh, do please get in touch uh, and we would be happy to respond to your inquiries. Thank you, David, and thank you, Bishop, for a really interesting conversation. And anyone who's listening, uh, all the details for what we talked about will be um, on the show notes. And also, if you've got any interesting stories or you'd like to nominate someone to be interviewed and featured in forthcoming episodes of the Sunday Sessions, drop me a line. My email address is on the bottom of this screen, and I look forward to uh, catching up with you at the next edition of the Sunday Sessions. Thank you very much for tuning in and have a great week.